This is a panel discussion. It's a philosophical <coughs> question, what is the difference between a session and a panel discussion? But the difference will be ostensive, which is people are not going to go up there and make speeches, they're going to make speeches sitting down. <laughs> um, <laughs> the hope is that, as the moderator, I will do better at curtailing the length. It, we, the opening statements will be in the sort of five to seven minutes range, and then I hope we will have a very lively discussion. We've got a lot of time, so, and it's a very big and important subject, the moral limits of markets. I was very intrigued by the question, by the way, why limits? But never mind, we <coughs> won't go there. Um, <coughs> the, Not the limit of moral. The, 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 um, so we'll need a lot of exciting questions to keep it going. Uh, and I've been told to remind you, and I will remind you now, and I will remind you at the end of this session, that this is not the last session. Because after this session <coughs> and a reception, we will have the final keynote lecture uh, um, by Luigi Zingales. And if that's not an exciting event, I will eat the hat I don't have. Because Luigi is always wonderfully brilliant and provocative and will provide, I'm sure, an excellent and robust counterpoint to Alan Kruger at the beginning, the two uh, views from the United States, if not necessarily two views from Americans. <laughs> now, um, so you should, I strongly recommend that you stay and enjoy that. Now, before handing it over to the panelists, um, uh, just very briefly, we have uh, Prof. Armin Falk, Professor Armin Falk from Bond University. We have Mr. Roger Devec uh, from the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. You know these people better than, even than I do. And to my right is, of course, Casper Villiger, former finance minister and president of Switzerland. If you, haven't, if you don't know who he is, I think you've probably been living for a very long time in a very different country. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I wanted to make some opening remarks which were not, unlike my remarks earlier, tendentious, um, or at least not tendentious in the same way. It seems to me important, I don't know whether this will help the panelists in any way, to think of what we mean by moral uh, as it relates to systems like markets and political processes. And it seems to me, or has seemed to me now for a very long time, we're talking about three different things, all in that one word. And though they're related to one another, they're not the same thing. And panelists may focus on all of them or just one of them or may even introduce something else. But my three different things are first, the quality of outcomes. Certain outcomes are perceived by some people as moral outcomes in the sense of being ben beneficial. And this is, of course, the sort of classic utilitarian view. Um, and utilitarianism has came out in our discussion since Gilles Saint-Paul attacked it, uh, relates to the notion of welfare or happiness. And so now a process, a market process, or uh, markets might be seen as moral because they promote certain things, outcomes that we think of as good, which might be prosperity itself, which increases people's choices, increases the, the, the way, improves the way they live. But it might be other things, some of us would argue, and I'll move on to another aspect, that without the development of market prosperity, industrialization, which was associated with that in the 19th century, the disappearance or the almost complete disappearance, that's a debate of proposition, of slavery would not have occurred. So these are outcome related properties of markets. The second aspect, which is clearly distinct, is the moral processes, the moral aspects of certain sorts of processes. So it would be seen, the argument would be, and that we did clearly hear this morning, that the market is moral because it embodies and responds to freedom of choice. And freedom itself is a profound moral value. So that, um, uh, the, it, it could also be argued, and indeed would be argued, that you can't have a market economy, proper functioning market economy, without the rule of law. And the law is itself a very profound, morally embedded 
process. Um, on the other hand, people might argue that some aspects of the market process lead to immoral results, such as the ability to exploit asymmetric information. Uh, the, ability, the, uh, the fact that the choices that people have in the market are radically unequal. Uh, so there is the question of what the market process is like and whether it should be seen as in itself moral or contributing to moral morality. And then the final aspect is what the, morality, what the market does to the behaviour of individuals. And I think a lot of the, the literature on this relates to whether the market processes makes us better people or worse people. Do we behave uh, in better ways because we're embedded in market economies or worse ways? Now, pro-market thinkers would argue and have argued, not would argue, have argued that living in a market economy with the means individual responsibility, individual accountability for one's own actions. It forces people to be more disciplined, more responsible, more careful about what they do because they are uh, ultimately bear a responsibility for their own actions. And that, that contributes to good moral qualities in individuals. And of course, others equally convinced would argue that uh, the market processes, and particularly when interpreted by economists tends to encourage people to be selfish, ruthless, and utterly indifferent to the fate of anybody else, anybody who is not significantly, uh, sufficiently competitive, sufficiently valuable in the market. And I discussed some of those uh, this morning. So the important point I wanted to make is when we think about the moral limits or moral aspects of markets, there are these three very different things, the outcomes it promotes, the processes it embodies and the behaviour it leads to. And these are related to one another, but they're clearly not the same thing. And it, it's, I think, valuable at least to try and make this distinction. So that's just the introductory remark I wanted to make. So with that, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to speak up to seven minutes or so, set out how they see it, and I'm going to start with Professor Falk, please. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I would not start because I'm sitting in the middle, but I'm no, happy you, you, to... I'm going to, to follow the alphabetical order. So seven but minutes... It's the least tendentious. <laughs> se <laughs> seven minutes... My disadvantage well, not life. as bad as my problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I would like to make two points to start with. One is the traditional discourse, and you've referred to that in, to some extent, uh, describes moral behavior as guided by people following moral principles, utilitarian principles, for example, rule-based Kantian type of principles. So the, the conception was people are having these rules and they follow them, and this is more or less you know, what the traditional philosophical discourse over the last two, 300 years in Europe uh, was all about. Now, research in the 1990s uh, in psychology, neurosciences, etc., has shown and, and suggested a picture that is very different to that, which is morality is malleable. We are different people in different situations. Moral outcomes, moral behavior, immoral behavior depends largely on emotional factors and institutions we are acting in. And that is why economics should reintegrate thinking about morality and, and should, you know, where it used to be with Adam Smith at the very beginning of economics, Adam Smith being a moral philosopher, uh, at that time thinking about morality and, and, and economics really belong to, to, together, should start to uh, reintegrate normative thinking and, and thinking about morality. Why? Because we have so much to say about how institutions affect people's behavior. Um, and one of the most important institutions, uh, and this is also part of this panel, uh, economists typically think about or talk about is markets. Right? And it's a long-standing controversial hypothesis or thought um, over the last hundreds of years that markets have a tendency to erode moral values. Right? Now, despite being a very old hypothesis, causal evidence on this issue has been scarce, if not non-existent at all. And this is not surprising because it's notoriously difficult to find out whether markets have a causal effect on moral outcomes. So it's difficult to change circumstances and observe the same actions within a market or not in a market. But it is possible. And how is it possible? You have to do an experiment. And we've done an experiment recently 
In the, in the remaining two and a half minutes, uh, I'm going to tell you about this experiment, then I shut up. I'd much more to yeah, say. You can, you can have Good. a little bit more than two oh, and a half. Fine. So what we basically did in this experiment was um, observing subjects randomly assigned, which means that provides causal evidence, there's no self-selection, into institutions, in markets, and in what we call individual decision-making behavior. And one of the key challenges of these experiments was to come up with a paradigm that captures the notion of immoral behavior. Now, I'm totally with you. It makes little sense to define what moral outcomes are. Uh, in fact, this is almost impossible. But there seems to be some general consensus, almost universally, that harming others in an intentional and unjustified way uh, is seen as immoral. Um, and therefore, we came up with a choice paradigm that does exactly this. And this is also focusing on something that you have not talked about. When we talk about the effects of markets, it's not only on those who do actually trade, but on external effects on those who are not sitting on the table, but may sac sacrifice or suffer anyways. So the choice paradigm is um, subjects are asked to either save the life of a mouse or to kill it. And if they kill it, they get money for it. Um, they get 10 euros to kill a mouse. Now, just to make sure that I'm a good guy, um, <laughs> these mice are so-called surplus mice, which means they would have been killed anyways, which is something <laughs> that these subjects didn't know. So they're perfectly healthy. They were raised for animal research purposes, but turned out to be unsuited for further research. And routinely, these mice are gassed okay, with CO2. And subjects were informed about, you can take these 10 euros, and then your mouse will be killed. It will be gassed. They were shown a video. It was crystal clear to them that as a consequence of taking money, they would cause harm on a third party in an unjustified and intentional matter. And we compare basically two situations. One is uh, willingness to kill for 10 euros in an individual condition, where you're fully, uh, at, at, uh, where, where responsibility is fully um, in the hands of the uh, individual subject, and markets where people could trade the life of a mouse. And roughly 45% decide to kill a mouse in the individual condition. In markets, it's 75%, a huge increase. And that suggests something that is, I think, very important and also new to economists, uh, at least to traditional economists. Institutions have an effect on our values. Institutions shape our moral valuations. It makes little sense from a standard econ perspective why you should place a different value on the life of a mouse or any item, essentially, when you trade in, uh, in a market versus if you can just buy or sell it in an individual condition. So what we show is, for the first time, I would say, a causal effect on moral decay in market versus non-market interactions. And I think this is a pervasive phenomenon in modern market societies, if you think about detrimental working conditions, for example. And we have strong moral values. We object to living conditions and working conditions people in developing countries are working in. But at the same time, we buy cheap electronics, fashion, etc., And in doing that, to some extent, tolerate the suffering of many people that we would never tolerate here. Firms that we buy products from would be closed and shut off immediately if they were trying to you know, set up business in Zurich or Berlin or New York. But be it you know, three, 5,000 kilometers away in Bangladesh, say, it is somehow OK. It's this remoteness uh, of globalization and market societies. It's the distinction between action and consequence. It's that you don't see the victims. It's diffusion of responsibility. It's shared guilt, it's social information. There's many mechanisms, I think, that come into play here when, when we think about why markets do what they do. But as a matter of fact, uh, the outcome, at least in the experiment, and I think it is actually a pervasive phenomenon outside the laboratory, and something that we really have to think about when we have to you know, think of how to improve and design institutions in a better way, have the capacity to erode moral values. Just to make clear, this <coughs> relates to the third of my uh, aspects of what I discussed. I mean, you're essentially saying that in these, this fascinating controlled experiment, markets, market institutions, uh, or market relationships, more precisely, uh, make us worse people for the moment, at the time the experiment is conducted. You're, it's, not a, you're not, it's not a hypothesis that necessarily is permanent. 
Well, we, we know relatively little about anything that is permanent, uh, but I have no reason to believe that if we are buying and selling, if we are acting as market participants, yes, that our values are different and that values are changed. And since we are currently doing this, um, it suggests that values are currently under pressure here. And to some extent, that's the irony of it. Uh, people violate their own standards, right? So if you have a group of people and randomly select them into two conditions, there's no reason to assume they have different opinions or values, right? But observing them in a particular situation, markets, uh, changes their valuations. That's very interesting. Um, Mr. Villiger. Well, I come back to your first question. I recently asked an American philosopher what does moral mean? And his answer was the distinction between good and bad. And then I asked him, uh, what is good and bad? And I didn't receive an answer. Now, in business and politics, I run an own company. I was minister. Uh, in these functions, you have to reside all the day. And you are every day, I think, several times faced with questions which have also uh, a moral aspect. And I tried to measure good and bad against some objectives. In politics, I tried to guide my actions with four objectives. I simplify a bit, but to show you also the conflicts of interests, of goals. Firstly, people should be able to develop themselves individually and freely. That means freedom according to their inclinations and talents. Uh, secondly, the people can only do that if they have a sufficient wealth. Therefore, otherwise they are not free. Therefore, the state has to enable the economy to develop this wealth. And thirdly, people have an innate preference for fairness, which does not, and we know that in Switzerland in the moment, which does not tolerate too large discrepancies in wealth. Therefore, the state must try to smoothen for extreme disparities. And people need, fourthly, sufficient protection against hardship of which they aren't responsible. Now, this objectives contain uh, large uh, conflicts of interests and an optimal balance between these conflicts has to be sought. This sounds now very theoretical but has very real consequences. All experience shows that only the market economy can generate sufficient wealth on the long run. Now people will only develop prosperity if they are allowed to keep the fruits of their work alone. I think uh, Atze Moglu has that shown in his book very clearly. Guarantee of ownership, moderate taxation, legal certainty, monetary stability and so on. You do something if you can keep the fruits. Now therefore for me the first moral command, and it sounds a bit strange maybe, is ensuring the most efficient market economy. And whoever violates this commandment not only damages the individual prosperity of people, but also endangers the welfare state and other adequate state services because somebody must earn the money, the wealth that can be distributed by the state afterwards. Now, the market economy, on the other hand, leads to an unequal distribution of income and wealth. And here, the state must intervene to provide a certain balance. And this is the second moral command to say so. If it does not so, the market economy loses its political base. That's something we are seeing now in a lot of countries. But if it exaggerates doing so, the market economy will no longer work. The state begins to destroy its own economic base. And this, I think, is the most uh, difficult balancing act of modern democracies. Now, the state has two important instruments for smoothing the distribution of wealth. I will not go into the details. Progressive income taxes, here we have quite a world record also in Switzerland, if you take, for instance, direct Bundessteuer. The second is social welfare funded as well on the basis of solidarity. For instance, in Switzerland, AHV, uh, every income above 80,000 francs a year per year is a pure tax. I agree with this system. I find it just, but it's very solidaric. And in addition to that, we have in, as a difference to other countries, we have a, a property tax on the cantonal level. Now, this dilemma is maybe best reflected in the social benefits. When the contributions are too high, contributors lose performance incentives. The result is they work less, they don't declare income. A friend of mine uh, wanted the, the, the check uh, when he made some works in, in Italy in his kitchen. And the answer was, do you want really to support uh, Bunga Bunga? Or do you want to make it without uh, the, the check net? 
And then on the other hand, when the benefits are too high, people lose the incentive to work. And then that's the social tourism and the tourism and things like that. Now, market economy needs entrepreneurial freedom to be innovative and provide maximum performance. But freedom can also be abused, otherwise it's no freedom. Therefore, companies need to act responsibly, or in other words, not everything that is not prohibited should be done. That's why there are, in my opinion, really moral limits of the markets. Now, if companies do not act accordingly, the market economy, economy loses its political support and politics intervenes with regulation. I think, uh, I think economy itself uh, originated a lot of regulation they criticized by themselves, by immoral uh, behavior. But on the other hand, too much regulation strangles the market economy. Therefore, acting responsibly and morally correct is also in the interest of the company itself. And I know a little bit about what I'm talking about as a chairman of UBS who came as a fireman and of course not as the creator of the crisis. Some people forget that sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, here that's a very good example to see it. And here now new questions arise, I will stop here. But the uh, question on what that means, that are issues that, uh, such as a corporate culture, issues, structure of the remuneration system, what, do you, uh, uh, what is a remuneration system, are there wrong incentives, bad incentives, or good incentives, code of ethics, how to fill with life a code of ethics, manager selection, maybe also look a little bit on the character of a manager, and not only on, on his uh, skills, and so on, questions like that. That's for the moment. Thank you. Well, I think that's... Uh a masterpiece of compression in that you covered uh, pretty well all the big questions of politics, of contemporary politics. Uh, that in, was who asked for a Yes, and uh, <laughs> that will give us, I think, an enormous amount to talk about. Um, so the last contribution is from you, Mr. Devek. Thank you. It's a pleasure to dialogue with you with the proud humility of a journalist. As you know, the difference between economists uh, lawyers and journalists, economists think twice before they say something, lawyers think twice and then prefer to say nothing, and journalists say twice before they think about it. <laughs> With the exception of Martin Wolf. <laughs> May I raise very briefly ten aspects. First, markets reach moral limits when market is a religion. Some politicians have transformed the market in a superstition, in a religion. And we have to make the difference between market economics and market theology. It's immoral to attribute divinity to a mechanism, to an instrument, because every instrument is ambiguous. With a knife, you can commit a crime and do the best. In other words, the market is not infable as the Pope. Second, markets have moral limits because there is no perfect market. Because in the really existing capitalism, we have the really existing market. And the really existing capitalism is in Europe, but not only in Europe, a hybrid economy, a mixed economy. We have everywhere a close interaction of market and state. Market and state become more and more the same thing. Look at the energy sector, no private insurer would insure a nuclear power plant because the risk is too high. Look at the infrastructure, look at the new te technologies driven by the armament programs of the military industrial complex, or today the military digital complex. Look at education, health, agriculture, finance system. The finance system wouldn't survive without central banks. State and state interest are driving a lot of markets and states have, no, have some roots, but no morality. Third, markets reach moral limit because they have only one dimension, the economic dimension. In the marketplace, everything is measured in money and overstretched markets erode non-economic values such as democracy, social values, ecological values or cultural values. Sometimes precisely those goods have a great value that are not in demand. What uh, some market-driven commercial media offer, since they are subject to a tough competition, has to be of low quality and harms democracy. I'm uh, working in a media sector 
where less quality means more profits. The market transforms citizens in consumers, and a lot of them are more consumers than citizens, and democracy is in danger when the civic spirit disappears. Fourth, if the marketplace is the focal point of our society, he shapes her mindset, and the market economy gets out to a market society. A family would fail whose members treated each other as competitors and not as partners in solidarity. A market-driven society is fragile. Too much market weakens its cohesion. Next point, the market is very one-sided. It only reflects the needs of people that have money. But as Amartya Sen said, the needs of people without money are more urgent as the needs of people with money. Six points, may I ask with the sociologist Max Weber, who is the market? When uh, George Soros attacked the British pound in 1992, one single man was for one single day basically, basically the market. George Soros and he alone. The moral of market depends of the sociology and of the morality of the market participants. Sixth point, those who have political power largely determine the rules on the market, and this has nothing to do with a fair market order. For example, the current market order allowed the US superpower to borrow massively abroad in dollars instead of euros or yen or Swiss francs without exchange rate risk. The international monetary system reflects power relations. No wonder that a polit politically rising China meditate on it to replace the dollar as the reserve currency. Or a totally different example, men dominate the labor market, which is why the majority of women is still paid less for comparable services. Next point, sometimes powerful market participants buy the policy they need. They finance political parties and officials, which then adopt the market rules that help them. Market activity is strongly influenced by interest groups, and interest groups are not moral groups, even NGOs. Next point, ironically, in an era in which the planned economies have collapsed, an immoral market bureaucracy lives on. If consumers want to cope with uh, airline tariffs, cell phone discount, loyalty cards, bonus point, airline miles, and optimize the benefits, they have to spend a lot of time with a stupid job. More and more companies want to impose their strategy instead of understand the needs of their customer. Market bureaucrats are sometimes so authoritarian as once the planner of the plant economy. Last point, market economy is often a waste economy. It encourages consumers to consume even when they should consume less because markets are unstable when they don't grow. But creating markets and market interdependency is a way to secure peace. This is exactly the success story of the European Union in the long run. Opening markets is a way to create welfare and stability. Introducing market economies on the long run a way to undermine communist parties and other dictators. In other words, markets are also an instrument to set moral limits. It's a question of balance. My conclusions, market economy, yes. Market society, no. Market society weakens the market economy because a market society weakens non-economic values. But market economy needs a minimum of reliability, a minimum of respect of non-written rules, a minimum of respect of the losers. A market's economy needs bona fide. Crisis in the banking system, for example, is a crisis not of market economy, but of market society. The advantage is that the crisis is always the occasion to set new moral limits. This has been a, a, it's an impressive <coughs> list. Can I remember them all? I'll do my best. Uh, the, um, we don't really have a defender here, which is so I'm going to have to play this role, obviously. Um, 
Oh, markets are great. The, the, um, let me just start, if I may. Well, actually, I'll start in a slightly different way. I wanted to ask um, each of you, actually, since you've made your in original in interventions, for one thing, if, if there is, that the others have, that each of the others has said with which you really strongly disagree. I just want to make, get some idea of the extent of disagreement here. So I will start with you, actually, Professor Falk. Um, is what the other two have said, is there something here that, that they have said with which you strongly disagree? No. <laughs> this is going to be a very depressing panel. <laughs> OK. Um, Ill design, yeah. Mr. Villiger. No, I think basically, uh, I think you told about your experiments, and I cannot judge whether uh, I ca cannot judge it. I, I read it before. I think it was uh, an interesting outcome. Uh, you mentioned the, the Bangladesh uh, issue. That, that if you allow me a remark, I think here, uh, here NGOs, uh, critical critical consumers, also politicians and so, can play a, an important role. And you might certainly know that at least in Switzerland, some of the big, uh, the big stores uh, made an agreement that they do not want any more by uh, material, and this was not their own moral, they, that was a moral which was forced to them maybe by these critics uh, outside. That means, for me, that has a very general aspect. I think uh, sometimes, of course, I didn't like them either, these NGOs and these critics. But basically, they force a company to th rethink what they are doing. I take the example of, uh, for instance, of UBS. We defined businesses we do not want anymore to do. Streubomben, Personenminen, I don't know in all the English uh, uh, expressions, or palm oil produced in a, in a non-sustainable way, things like that. We put that in the codes of ethics. And I think here, these people can play really a role to sensibilize maybe the, also the, the industry to do something, and then it's in the interest of the industry not to be always in the newspapers, always criticized. And I think here there are sel some self-correction elements in that. What uh, Mr. Rubek said, here I, I think I could agree with almost all what you say, but at the end of the day I had the impression that every evil you see somewhere you, you, you bring back to the markets. And I think we have also people which are, uh, you, you say uh, they, they are uh, always the temptation to eat, I, I don't know, too much sugar or, or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think we have citizens who are able to decide whether Switzerland to join the European uh, union or not, or whether we should uh, go to the Bretton Woods institution, but at the end of the day they don't know what they should eat for breakfast. I think there is a, a kind of self-responsibility in, in educated people also, which you, where we should have a certain trust in. But for, I agree, but I think it was a little bit too much elements and critics which I would not, if, if you would like to solve all that with regulation or whatever, but you, I agree with you also regulation, we might come back of that, has, his, uh, has a lot of problems and a lot of, uh, of bad things are created by wrong regulation. Because regulation sets incentives and you never really know how people react on these new incentives. Uh, I think it was a little bit too much against the markets, but basically, uh, the critics, I could agree, but a little bit exaggerated. This is probably about as close to ferocious disagreement as I can expect to hear in yeah. Switzerland. <laughs> um, before we come to you, uh, Mr. Devec, how do you re react to what you heard mm -hmm. and even the uh, very mild criticism you've just heard? I think the best way to defend market is just to lower the level of expectations what a market can do. Uh, other principles than the market as, are as, as efficient as market. Cooperation, for example, and uh, a lot of, economic, you know, of research of economics in the last decades focused on cooperation. The center of our society today is the internet. The internet was invented not by market and competition, it was in invented in Geneva, at the CERN, with, uh, on the cooperation principle. So I think that uh, market economy, when it is just uh, put at the center of our society, 
just is, uh, becomes less efficient, becomes uh, overloaded, overstretched with expectation that market never will fulfill. Just one small correction, <coughs> which is, sorry, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN, mm -hmm. but the internet was invented by DARPA. Uh, which is also uh, part of the, a government, rather an important part of an important okay, government. Okay, 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 but yes, please, so I was going to ask you to... So, um, something that now bothers me, so now I can say something more negative here, Good. <laughs> uh, which I'm very happy about. I mean, the discussion is not about are we in favour of markets or not. I mean, this is totally ridiculous. Of course we are in favour of markets. This is totally ridiculous, okay? No one questions the great virtues of market economies. I mean, I'm not giving you an introduction to Micro 101 or something, and some of my colleagues would do an even better job in this. This is not the question at all. And there's no alternative to that at all. The way I view this problem is, it's like good medication. We all want aspirin, we all want penicillin, what, what, what else, right? And no one would ever say we should abolish that. If it's good medication, we should have it. But some of the medication does have side effects. And it's these side effects that we have to clarify and think about. And these side effects can be tremendous. These side effects can be detrimental for hundreds and thousands of people. Not to speak about the environment, not to speak about how animals are kept. I mean, if you look around as a critical consumer, you will see zillions of occasions where your moral principles are orthogonally rejected and, and put into question. And of course, some interest groups take that up and then try to do something, that's great. And this is not in contrast to, to, to what I'm saying, but the market itself often generates these situations. And I think we need to better understand how these situations favor moral transgression and what the mechanisms are, not to abolish markets, but to make them even better, to reduce some of these side effects. Um, that is, I think, the, the debate that we should have and not whether we should have markets or not. That is totally Churchill ridiculous. Churchill said that uh, democracy was the worst political system with the exception of all others. And I would say market is the best economic system with the exception of all others. The, the worst with the exception of all others. But the question is, in our internet times, is how long market will just last? We observe that we had... Uh, an economy since uh, Jesus Christ of uh, Agora, Forum, Bazaar, small markets with um, billions and billions of uh, small intermediaries. And mm, a lot of them are now wiped out by global, high-efficient, low-cost intermediary infrastructure, as Facebook, for example, one is. And uh, the future of the market and the future mechanisms of the market Will they function as they function basically since uh, two or three thousand years? This is, in my view, uh, one of the big questions. But isn't that, let come to this in, a, in uh, um, because it gets to the reform issue. But surely the point on that, just that in my role as a moderator, the market has constantly changed, as you already implied. The the quote-unquote market economy we have now, the, the pr principal institutions in our contemporary market economy, for instance, which I mentioned this morning, the, uh, the joint stock liability company, uh, ne never mind the global conglomerate, these are things that were inconceivable to Adam Smith. Uh, by the way, he was against them. Uh, interestingly, to the extent they were conceivable, he associated them with monopoly. But the point is that we, this process of change in the nature of a competitive market process and the institutions within them has always been itself part of the market. Just as, in my view, the interaction of the market with politics has also always been part of it. So when we, in a way, we're not talking about, in this sense, it seems we're not talking about something new. But what we are surely trying to do, just to get your response to, is to consider where, given where we are now, we think the high priorities are for changes that will improve the moral consequences of market. That seems to me, isn't that really where we are? It's not that suddenly everything will be, it's still, the, uh, it's still in a very broad process, there's still competition, there's still uh, market processes of some kind, but of course the institutional forms they take and the precisely how they work changes all the time. Isn't that right? Sorry. 
Yeah, I, I would like, I, I think you are right. But I would like to, to say something to Mr. Falk. Maybe come back to your question. Great. No, I didn't. Of course, I didn't. Of course, you didn't. I, I, it was not my impression that you criticized the markets. But you found out with an experiment that there are situations where the market can create immoral incentives. Mm -hmm. And there are others. I think I read the example of, you know, that the poor guy who to get food has to sell his kidney. Uh, a lot of, of things like that. And I ask myself, this is true. I do not say it's wrong. On the other hand, I say, what solution would be better? And I think if you criticize the outcome of a market mechanism, the, the real question is, what is the better solution? Let's take uh, you think it's the market to, to, to distribute jobs in the market or to assign jobs in the market is maybe not always just. What is the, what is the alternative? The alternative is maybe networking or whatever, what you have. Uh, privileged classes is not an alternative. Maybe market is not good, but better than other solutions. And here, my, my thinking is, I, uh, I'm very in favor of a market who really can, uh, can create values, uh, economical values, with not too many distortions. And if we have distortions, we have in a kind of secondary redistribution to try to make it a little more, a little bit more equitable. And here, of course, are very delicate problems. For instance, we all know that unemployment of young, peoples, young people worldwide, uh, or especially in, in some countries, are a problem, a lost generation, you can even say. And now, politics always said we have to intervene in market, we have to protect the people who have labor, and the effect is that the people who have labor are protected, and the people who have uh, no labor, they are lost. My daughter was, uh, during a certain time in Italy, and knew that no contract, everything, only for a couple of months and so on. That means, and he, here I come back to Max Weber, the Gesinnungsethics and Verantwortungsethics, the politicians say, we want to do the good, we take a regulation, we make, we regulate, or with minimal wages or whatever, and at the end of the day, they did something good, but the outcome is worse than before. And that's the reason why I think we have to try to leave where the markets are really strong, in creating economical values, to leave work and to try to find other solutions and also the, the responsibility to smoothen where effects come out that we uh, do not like. And I think we, if we have to watch at problem per problem. I mean, the, the, the problem is a little bit deeper, actually. And, and we have some famous economists sitting around, and I'd love to ask you, but I know what that I wouldn't get a good answer anyways. I, I'm pretty sure about this, because I've done this for two years now. What is a market? Markets do not exist. See, Gilles says markets don't exist. I don't think this is the only answer I would have gotten, but you know, the range is quite large. Right? So this is another issue. When we talk about markets, it's, not, it's, a, it's an ill-defined object to some extent, and people don't have a clue. If you read Mike Sandel's book, who I like a lot and, and, and talk to, etc., has good ideas about you know, what, what works well or not, but he's confusing all the time you know, money as an exchange medium from market interactions. Is it organizations? Is it pricing? Is it price tags, etc., etc.? And I'm, I'm happy to talk about this even more. But I think conceptually we have to really move on and um, to think about what are the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms that tempt people into behaving immorally. And I think this is an important question. And economists have not really started to think about this. And I would like to give you one example of a channel that I think is particularly powerful when it comes to trading. May, may, may or may not want to call it markets. And that is diffusion of pivotality or diffusion of responsibility. One of the most frequent excuses people make if they do something, buy something, for example, is if I don't buy it or sell it, someone else may. It's like, should we export weapons to Syria? Well, why not? If we don't do it, Russia will, right? Uh, Joe Sobel has called this replacement logic. And I think it's a very, very powerful argument in that it, it frees yourself, provides an excuse for acting in an immoral way because you think or believe or may want to believe that if, if you don't behave otherwise, good things won't happen anyways. And we tested exactly this intuition with our mouse paradigm. And I'd like to tell you this in two minutes. By the way, the mice that were not killed were all saved. And they were all bought by me. 
i.e. the German taxpayer, I should say. <laughs> uh, so there's a welfare issue involved in this, is, if, if you like. And they're all, you know, in best conditions. They, they, they're doing great. I mean, I'm not a mouse, but they're super happy. They, they get health care, everything. There are better conditions than many people on this planet, I tell you. So what we did is we did the same individual condition and then had another condition where people were in a group of eight. So it's a slight organizational change. It's a minimum change. Okay? You are in a group of eight. And the decision is to either choose A or B. It's as simple as this. If you choose A, you get no money. If you choose B, you get 10 euros. Regardless of what the other people in this group do, it's a simultaneous decision-making problem. If at least one of the eight people in the group chooses option B, eight mice are killed. <coughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> eight mice are killed. Um, from a rule-based perspective, you should do or not do whatever you think is right. From a utilitarian perspective, you could say, well, there's always one asshole in the group anyways. right? So if the likelihood that some group member chooses option B is sufficiently high, I might, might as well choose B, cash in the 10 euros, because I'm not consequentialistically enforcing the bad outcome. It's exactly this replacement logic that I was referring to in markets. What happens? Killing rates go up. All mice in all groups were always killed. And what I'm interested in is, is exactly these mechanisms. Making or delegating decisions to groups is something that happens every day in almost all organizations. And if organizations fail to attribute individual responsibility, replacement arguments take place. You have that also in delegation, in authority, in division of labor. There are many institutional mechanisms that have exactly the same logic. You're no longer individually responsible. And then as a group, you produce totally insane outcomes. It's also much cheaper from an organizational point of view. If you were interested in killing mice, just put many people in one group, implement a group decision rule, and then you don't pay 10 euros per dead mice, but only five. So slight organizational changes can have huge effects on immoral or moral outcomes. And I think that is something that we really have to better understand. And that's not a question about do we want markets or not. It's how to, to inform the organization of institutions in a way that helps uh, the promoting argument, moral the, outcomes. The example you gave there could apply to any institution. Absolutely. It, one Absolutely. embedded in markets Absolutely. or a governmental institution, Absolutely. conceivably. No, no. In Absolutely. fact, it is the argument governmental institutions Absolutely. make all the time. No, so a lot of your work is really, seems to me, a, uh, there, the first part, part the, the Bangladesh, uh, the, the, the first example clearly was about effects on individual behavior in a quasi-market setting. Many, well, um, it was a market. It was but a market. In, the, in the, well, we, we've worked on this philosophical discussion we're going to have later. The, the, but the second one is just, just a, a, it's, a, it's a prisoner's dilemma type of problem, no, no, isn't no, it? No, 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 it's not a prisoner's isn't dilemma. Isn't it? No, no, it's not a prisoner's dilemma. Um, it's not a well, we don't need to go into the technical details of the game. I was, the, before, we just broaden out your points a little, a little, and then I'll go to allow, allow people to the floor. You sort of assume that it is obvious, completely obvious, when you generalise beyond your examples, that um, trading with Bangladesh, even though its conditions are not ones we would prefer, is obviously immoral, just self-evident. Now, what about the counter-argument? I know all the counter-arguments, and that's all mistaken, right? Well, we don't talk about the pros and cons of child labor here. We don't talk about what happens if, they, if we would forbid trading. Of course, they would be worse off. I know all of these arguments, trust me. But economists are just not having a language to talk about exploitation, full stop. We don't reveal preferences, fine. I know all the textbook stuff, you know, and I never said, look, let's close all these factories. This is completely stupid. Of course I'm not saying this. What I'm saying is I just don't, don't for any longer want to stand the fact that we live in a world. I mean, look around. Look around. I mean, you live in Zurich, right? Could, there were worse places. That we consume things, that we live in a, in a world, and at the same time, much of that additional value that is generated, cheap clothes, etc. An iPhone, 500 francs, that's way too cheap. There's blood on this iPhone, and you all know that, right? I'm just no longer to accept that fact. We could easily redistribute some of the money. We could easily enforce some of the 
some of the work safety and, 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 and things uh, in these countries and say, look, unless you implement them, I know there's corruption in these countries, it's politically very difficult, it's all well taken, but it's, the alternative is not to sit there and say it's reveal preferences, it's their choice, it's welfare enhancing, right? We know that from textbook economics. I'm just, look, if I go to Thailand, right, there's a 12-year-old girl, I want to have sex. I say, look, what about having sex? 10 euros? Oh, I'm generous. 15. She does it. It's revealed preferences. Both are better off. Is welfare improving? Is that the economics answer to that problem? No. And I'm just not willing but to accept I'm, that. And, and, no, and, and I understand therefore, that position. You cannot, you can't. What is the answer? The, on the, well, we to have take to talk your, about, well, if you talk this, about We are talking about the, the question is the moral limits of markets. So you have made a very, very strong statement that certain market transactions are inherently immoral. Uh, <clears throat> inherently immoral, whether or not they improve, whether or not their welfare expanding. So we are in the world which the other two gentlemen have, have been discussing, which is, uh, at least to some degree, which is what are the alternative arrangements. So in the case of Bangladesh, the alternative arrangement would seem to be that we should Im impose and or pay for a general improvement of the welfare standards of labour yeah. there and in all other countries. And it's right. consumers here that could pay it easily. And for you, them. and and presumably the process through which one does that is a democratic political process. Yes. Yes. And you put forward the proposal that one should do this, and you lose. Well, I don't know. I mean, and, and that's, that's a totally well. This is a totally different issue. I'm just saying, <laughs> what is going on? Why it's not okay that it is going on? That markets have a severe problem in that respect, despite being great institutions, as I said before. And, and the next question is a political issue. But, you know, environmental politics also came about over the last 40 years and has improved our living conditions tremendously. Look, I was born at the Rhine River. When I was a kid, it was a stinking, awful, ugly, dirty river. You couldn't even piss in it, so dirty it was. <laughs> Nowadays, there are all these signs don't swim there because it's so dangerous. But it's so tempting because it's clean, right? Even though it goes through Switzerland and Basel, right? So. Um, so it has improved tremendously. Living conditions have just gone up. Against, you know, people from the market side, you know, lobbying uh, firms saying this is killing the industrial... Uh, I'm um, going to have to let, let the others... You've got the point. Again. So there's something we can do and we have to Respond to these provocations. No, two, re two remarks. One is uh, I appreciate all this research in group that Ernst may makes, Audrey makes. I read with a lot of personal profit, the Kahneman book. I would make a lot of things maybe different now in my life, knowing how I myself make mistakes. Um, and I think you can use a lot of that to make also to, to run a company better. I, I take an example. I think we all have around pit, pitfalls. We have traps where we go in irrational behavior. Uh, one, one is you have a very good CEO that is very authoritarian. Uh, nobody ha has the courage to have a different uh, dissenting opinion. He has a lot of yes men around him and then he's very successful. He begins to make mistakes and all of a sudden goes down. I know that in the bank uh, that I had the pleasure, more or less pleasure to work for. Uh, there has been a period where people who had a different opinion were not really uh, uh, welcomed uh, excitingly by, by the others and so on. And I think here uh, a lot of, I, I saw a little trick in Kahneman, what you can do that if you have a little group that the people tell you the truth and not what you like to listen. And a lot, I think a lot of things like that uh, are very useful. I think if you want to regulate everything, and to break, then at the end of the day, a company needs no more engineers, but only lawyers. We are almost there, but not yet. And I think at the end of the day, you need a free space for responsibility and where you have to trust that people are doing the right thing. And that's the reason why, for me, the way to solve the problem there is maybe much better what we try to help to these people to develop that they can create wealth and the middle class, what we have achieved in a lot of Asian countries. 
uh, to, to take that from a macroeconomic perspective, to, to try to influence them. A lot of our failed states, not always the market economy which is wrong, it's, it's our failed state. We know all the wrong incentives of democracies. You are elected every four years, that's why you don't think in generations, you think in four years. You, uh, you are never liable for the money that the state spent because you spent the money as a minister or a parliamentarian now, but your successors have to pay it or the next generations. There are also, also, uh, also politics is full of wrong incentives. And that's why, uh, and, and the state is very important to grant market economy because if you leave the market to itself, all the ones who have success want to try to, 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 to make a cartel, to protect what they earn forever and things like that. That means for me, the state is an as important partner for the development as the market itself or the market economy, how you say. And for me, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult to have here a problem, there a problem, and to drive how can we, instead of, of, of general education, how can we solve that with a new rule or whatever. I would prefer to help to the countries to come out of this poverty, which creates a lot of market problems because people can't afford things, people are not informed and so on, to come from this way. And that was, in the last 60 years, quite successful. Roger, Mr. Devec. Just to uh, put it very simple, we need institutions to set good rules, and we need individual responsibility to set standards, what is allowed within the rules and what not. And in a globalized economy, it's much more difficult to set rules because uh, uh, institutions remain mostly national and the markets are international. And in a globalized economy, it's much more difficult to set standards, what is allowed within the rules, because the participants to the market don't share the same values and have totally have no common values. In Great Britain, you have no written constitution because there is a fundus of common values. So you hadn't to write anything. In Korea, in the 19th century, uh, they had no laws because the standards were so strong that they didn't uh, use laws. And I think the great task of the next decades so or maybe the next centuries will be to create new globalized rules and new globalized values. And as long as those two aspects will be in difficulty, uh, markets will be much more unstable as they were before. I'm going to, uh, to uh, we could go on, I think I now realise, for hours on this, uh, but I'm going to actually uh, ask people whether they would like to ask questions. I can't imagine they don't. Uh, I'll even entertain very, very short speeches, like 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> please. <coughs> um, you, might, you might as well say I have who a comment and a question. And the command, a comment and a question. A comment and a question, oh, yeah. Okay. The comment is this. So the, the major argument in favor of market economies before they existed was that it makes people peaceful and docile. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's very hard to prove that, but I, I believe there is a case to be made here. And another argument is, another argument, I mean, another interesting finding is, it's not causal evidence, but it is an interesting finding, is when we look at very simple societies and look at the extent to which they develop fairness norms, it turned out that uh, those societies, so these are very simple societies that have sometimes very little involvement in, in market transactions at all. And it, what it turned out, and that's quite interesting, is that those societies who were more integrated into market trading, they had developed more st st stronger fairness norms. So that's, that's an interesting finding uh, that, that I think uh, is, is interesting to take into account to, to, to keep the balance. Now, the other thing is I wonder in this discussion that you, that also Armin had here with the others, uh, what is different here from the usual argument that the economists put forward in, 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 in favor of the legitimacy of, let's say, interventions into the market economy? Our, our traditional argument is that there is an externality, that you harm people, somehow market transactions harm people, harm non-involved parties, and therefore 
you have, for example, environmental laws and things like that. Now, I have not fully understood in, in, in to the, the extent to which your argument is different. Because in the end, what you're saying is there is an externality. You may call it a moral externality. And what that means is you have a collective action problem, and you have to solve that collection, collective action problem with appropriate alternative institutions, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. So I think in, so. it's really, in this way, you can reconcile it with the traditional way we think about uh, the legitimacy of, of interventions. Now, that the point is to what extent do we agree on the moral le le illegitimacy of the externalities you, ha you have here. Thanks. Can uh, I, no, can you just wait a minute? I'd like to take a few questions. So you will, uh, I so break. I can sort of, and, and, I'll, and I will take three. Uh, okay, Gilles, yeah, here, you don't then I'll try and see if please. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, talking about the moral limits of markets is a bit like talking about the moral limits of screwdrivers. Uh, <laughs> it does not, it's what you do with a screwdriver. If you screw uh, an explosive device, then it's immoral. And if you screw uh, uh, some uh, good thing, then it's moral. Uh, I think morality is a property uh, not of markets, not of institutions, but of human actions. And you know, you are doing something Im immoral, or you are not, but that's not by business in some sense. And I think also, this is more directed to Armin, you have a sort of Thomist view of morality, which is we are all in the same boat, and I'm supposed to have compassion and to suffer of, uh, and, to, and to react to any immoral act taking place somewhere in the planet, you know? But um, this posture is just impossible because whatever your action, uh, whatever course of action you take, it is going to be a causal factor in some immorality somewhere down the road. Like, you know, you buy stuff from Bangladesh, you are um, subsidizing child labor. You don't, well, maybe some child is going to die in Bangladesh because uh, wages are going to fall in Bangladesh. You take vacation in the, in the West Indies, you are going to increase CO2 emissions, and maybe somebody is going to, uh, to drone uh, 100 years from now. You don't go to a vacation West <coughs> Indies. Maybe somebody is going to lose his or her job because of you, because the company is going to go bankrupt, and this person is going to commit, commit suicide. suicide. Right? I just wanted to. So just yeah. because, <laughs> at exactly. least, at least. Exactly. Well, this happens, uh, you no, know, unemployment is a cause of suicide. You know that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just becoming impossible, right? And if you care so much about mice, you should not eat anything because every single agricultural product is produced with pesticides and they kill many more mice than you saved during your experiment. So at the end of the day, the only thing that you can do is impose morality on your own actions uh, and I don't see how you can go beyond yeah. that. No. Can I answer yes, this? I, we'll go. Let's, we've got enough here to last uh, half an hour, I think. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> but Martin will have his chance. Okay, so um, yeah, let's start with you and your response these, to these, these comments. These two things really um, belong together. And excellent questions, and it gives me a chance to really clarify issues here. Before we talk about politics, okay, and, and recommendations, and it's something I didn't really want to talk about, we talk about something that is new to economists, which is values elicited depend on the institution you are in, in a, in a systematic and non-trivial way. And that causes the problem. Look, I never said people should be more moral than they are. My statement is, take a given distribution of moral values. And I'm not commenting on is this good or bad. I just take it as given, okay? And then what I document is, if you put the same people in a different institution, you get a different distribution of moral values. And that's the causal effect of an institutional moral valuation. And that is the externality that you're referring to, completely rightly so. And it's that externality that we should then politically think about. But the first step is to realize that moral values are endogenous to markets or to interactions that we are uh, taking decisions in. And I think that is, that is a very important point to clarify. 
And then if that is true, we violate our own moral standards. And in that sense, we are not only improving efficiency or welfare on, on behalf of third parties that are involved, we are actually improving our own state. It's a bit like a self-control problem, if you like. Right? You don't want to smoke, but you smoke anyways. And if you forbid smoking, then this could reduce uh, the self-control problem. And in some sense, it's related to some self-control issue. But institutions more generally have that tendency. So it's not just in markets, it's also, as I refer to organizations, I could give you many examples where we see similar phenomena. And I think that is important to realize. And this then calls for political action, because we would like to go back to our moral values that we have and not uh, violate them. Short comment on your, um, <laughs> on your paper on primitive societies. Um, you, you mentioned it's not causal, and yet you gave a suggestive flair that it may be. The causality is probably exactly the opposite. Um, markets require social values, so it's not surprising that there's a co-evolution of social values like fairness, reciprocity, trust, et cetera, social capital in some broader sense, and market economies, because without them, they cannot even function. Right? So observing in a cross-section, uh, cross-regional analysis that uh, more market is associated with more social values does exactly not what we do. It's just re you know, showing some co-evolutionary uh, tendencies that these two things could evolve. And, and then finally, with, you know, she, of course, I mean, I don't know what the right policy, what I'm saying is there's, a, there's, there's demand for political action if we don't want to violate our own moral values. What the best political action is, I don't know. Is there any political action that does only good and harms nobody? No, of course there's not. Does that then imply we shouldn't do anything? Why do we have mandatory schooling? Why, why do we not allow killing? I mean, if, you know, if I take your argument to the extreme, why, you know, why do we have any rules? I mean, of course, any, someone is always harmed by it. And the question is not zero one. The question is, can we get some improvement? And in terms of the Bangladesh uh, companies, I'm not saying we should you know, close these factories. But say the, the difference is taking a very concrete example in fire safety laws, right? This is Switzerland. This is what would be efficient. Switzerland is above. I'm pretty sure about that. Same is true in Germany. It's, it's insane, right? It's 20% above what would be efficient. And this is Bangladesh. No safety rules at all. And I'm not saying they should have Swiss standards because that would essentially mean close these businesses. I'm not saying that. I'm saying take 10 cents, 20 cents of a sweatshirt, t-shirt that we sell here and use that money and make it, make it mandatory that if you want to import to Switzerland or to Germany that you have to comply with some level of safety. And we, yes, we consumers finance it. That would be a tractable and easy way net of political problems, of course, et cetera, et cetera, to improve standards of living. And I don't see why people commit suicide if safety laws are improved in these firms. I think that uh, he, he raised a broader question, which is, gets back to my introduction, which is the, the proposition that morality is entirely a property of individual behavior. How far would you go with that? Because your introduction obviously yeah. started, and this links again with the question raised by Professor. I think Dar Daron Asimoglu had here a speech and explained his book. And his theory is, if I understood it well, he said uh, whether a nation fails or not depends on the institutions and not on the culture, not on the climate, not on, on nothing. And I think, in a way, it's true because institutions give these incentives to, to, to perform, to do something. I explained that in the beginning. Do not want to repeat that. I personally think that culture is as important. Culture in the sense of values, exactly as you said. I'm a very big believer of, of that. If you have, you have countries with fantastic laws, but they fail because uh, they, uh, nobody, uh, nobody is following the laws or they have corruption or, or whatever. And that destroys this kind of values and in spite of good institutions, it, it doesn't work. And that for me is a reason that we have a space. Here we have markets, here we have uh, institutions and laws and regulations and we have a big space where we can expect that people can do something better or worse. 
And I think we can educate people also in companies to do it better. And you know what you said, I fear a bit, you will have a lot of, of people in Switzerland will be excited to have such a mark because that, that's, that protects their own products. Because he said, we don't want these imports from Bangladesh, we have a better, and if you have a mark on it and it's expensive, I have more chances. Then it's pure protectionism under the label of, of social, uh, social values. I, I, I know the people a little bit. That's why I am a believer also of, of, of education that you have, for instance, you can import wood in Switzerland, but you have a, can have a label on it that's well produced in a sustainable way, and a lot of people buy that. Uh, we do that as well. And I think that these values of the honest Kaufmann, that they're ehrbare Kaufmann, it's very sim moral is very simple if you do it in practice. Redlichkeit, Ehrlichkeit, uh, all, all these issues that you need, and I think you proved, Ernst, that that uh, cooperative groups are uh, co more competitive than groups with only egoists, and that uh, some uh, cooperative people can influence the whole group to be better. I think all these things we, we can use, and I'm personally convinced that the company can really feel values with life and be better afterwards. I'm not, if you are moral, you have not more success maybe on the market, but if you are immoral, you risk to have big problems. And that's the reason why I think you can fill a culture in a company with code ethics, with ethics, with code of conduct, and so on, but you have to fill them with life, that the written thing is, and that's what you said, the written issue alone is, is, has no value at all, but you can, by role models, by, by uh, changing a boss who is not a role model, and uh, what I said, you have to watch a little bit more the character of the people, to put incentives, for instance, in that's uh, what we try to do, to put incentives in a, in a system of, uh, of uh, life, of of performance uh, compensation, which is not material, which is uh, intangible, for instance, reputation of a company, or maybe values for the client, things like that, and not only the cash flow and the return on equity, things like that. And I think here you can make new models which give incentives also in companies to act more moral. And I'm a great believer that here we can make progress, and I think we made progress. If I compare the work in a board, 20, 30, 40 years ago, when I was first member of, and today, it's much more professional. It's much more looking around what are the consequences. Uh, at, at that time, when, when all, a lot of boards have been insider circles and, uh, and they made maybe more money with a lower salary on other ways. And today, uh, under observed by, by, by the public, by more transparency as it was before, I think we can make progress and the situation is not as bad as it seems sometimes when we read the newspapers. Mr. De Beck, do you want to comment on these questions? May I underline, as you did, uh, the institutional issue. We live in the 20th century, 21th centuries with institutions that were built in the 19th century on a national level and in the middle of the 20th century uh, on an international level. And they can't cope anymore with the globalization. And I think that uh, rebuilding new institutions, as we had in the last three decades, social reforms you need, we need now on the national and international level, uh, institutional reforms. Take, you mentioned uh, the moral strength of uh, institution. Take the Swiss democracy. Uh, if you empower the citizens, they make overall and on the long run better decisions. They act in a more responsible way. And if you look in Europe today, what are the successful countries economically and politically in Europe? It's Scandinavia, it's Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, all countries with a strong democracy, respect of the citizens, social partnership, uh, uh, search of consensus, not too much top-down decisions. Everywhere what, where reforms were uh, just organized in a top-down way, as in France, was in Italy with Berlusconi, that cumulated, uh, which cumulated the political power, the media power, and the economic power, or it didn't work. It didn't work. So I think that uh, 
strength, uh, redefining our institution will contribute to common values, will contribute to a common behavior, and uh, this is, in my way, the main task of the next two or three decades. I comment further on this myself, Martin. I have a comment <coughs> and an example. The comment. I'm uneasy about how you move back and forth between the word institutions and markets. And it's not even clear to me that this has much to do with markets uh, as opposed to power and abuse of power. And it's not clear to me what's the difference between your experiment and the Milgram experiment where someone had power to torture someone else seemingly and did so under authority of the scientific expert who told him that this was necessary. I mean, dilution of responsibility in the abuse of power seems to be the common theme. Now, the example, when I came to the University of Bonn in 77, there still was a colleague who had his assistants, mind you, postdocs, mow his lawn. A clear abuse of power and by the way, the same person subsequently on the Committee on Examinations made a comment that it was really unfortunate that written exams were graded anonymously, identified only by coded numbers, rather than by name, because if they were coded, encoded by name, one would know what grades to give. My own experience has been that when I had sent people after their doctorate to spend a year in the US and they came back, they more or less told me, be careful what you tell me. We've experienced that we have a market. We have a market. If we don't like the way you treat us, we'll go to the US. So I think there is the element that we can have abuse of power and uncontrolled power in hierarchies, and markets provide a scope for liberation from that, limitation to power. I submit that that's also relevant for the discussion. I'd like to take, um, is there anyone at the back? Yes, the gentleman, uh, yes, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. I was very impressed by this uh, mouse paradigm and we learned from it that uh, markets are an excellent way to exchange goods and money but a not very good way to exchange moral values. So I think shouldn't we be more uh, looking for ways to actually convey moral values from producers to consumers because due to all these fragmented markets we have today most values cannot travel anymore. Okay. Um, somebody else, just behind there. That'd be fine, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor Falk uh, wondered earlier, um, what are the mechanisms um, for making people basically behave in a aroma, um, amoral way? And I was wondering whether maybe the fact that everybody is bombarded every day by I think more than 5,000 uh, marketing messages every day um, is also a reason why people uh, not necessarily behave according to their values anymore, but according to uh, something else. And um, I think uh, companies wouldn't spend billions of dollars every year um, if, if this was an efficient way of basically doing some kind of brainwashing. And I even heard at one point once uh, an American marketing exper uh, um, expert who said that basically his job is, is to, to make people unhappy so they buy more. So I was wondering whether maybe uh, the, the, the people on stage could uh, maybe like think about, <laughs> I don't know the name anymore, um, about uh, maybe regulating uh, advertisement a little bit more. Thank you. I'm going to actually not start with Professor Falk. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Devec. On this point that Martin Helvig raised, which seems to me very important, it was related to my second category, processes, and the argument being that essentially in a market setting, I'm not going to get into the philosophical question of market setting is, but a setting in which there are exit opportunities where people can leave where they are and go somewhere else because in, the, in, their, in their transactions, in the labor market, whatever it may be, 
This gives them freedom. And because it gives them freedom, it reduces power upon them. And that is, that has moral value. One might argue that that has very profound moral value, over and above whether it gives them wealth. And what has been described here are largely failures of, uh, of hierarchy rather than failures of markets. How would you respond? You asked me? Yes. Oh, I'm asking you. Just... <laughs> Because you gave ten lists of failures, so I thought of see if I can make you uh, commit yourself to one success. <laughs> Probably will not no, manage. But I ended my speech yeah, I with know, I know. I, four I know. or five. I know. I'm, success I'm... points. I mean, the crucial point is that in a society which in which market competition plays a fundamental role. People have freedom to choose mm -hmm. to some significant degree. And that is a reflection of embodiment of freedom. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendously powerful moral value. It's a tremendously powerful value if you are able to participate to the market. And you have in the world society probably more than 50% of uh, people not able to participate to this market. And this is, in my view, in a market logic, with market ethics, if you want, one of the main tasks, just to enable 50% of the humanity to participate to this market. And they need uh, what you, they need skills, they need a minimum of money, they need uh, an entitlement of their prop propriety, they need, they have the basics to participate to the market uh, have to be created. This is, in my view, the, the, the main task. But if you're saying that, then the, the, you're saying that the moral limits of markets the, is almost the same thing as the limits of markets, I, that what we should be doing, in fact, is promoting and extending them. It's one of the main tasks to extend the market, but in a way that uh, enables all the... Um, the excluded from the markets to be full valuable market participants. The, marking, the market is including and excluding. The market is in a way the survival of the fittest and uh, gives these incredible dynamics that we have in our economies. And on the other way, it is excluding and the losers or the non-participants to the markets just are left behind. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you have to admit, I'll, perhaps I could, I'll address this to you because it fits in. It fits in, it also seems to me with what Professor Falk is saying, uh, if I understand, on one, this one, one of the main reasons so many people, perhaps the main reason so many people are excluded from the market is because we have national borders. And because we have national borders above all control and the movement of people, we, we don't have a global society. A great many people are locked into very poor places, possibly very badly governed, they're massively exploited, we go and exploit them. So the logical conclusion is, in fact, and these are all enforced by states. These, exclude, these controls are all enforced by states. So the logical conclusion, it would seem to me, if that's what you're concerned with, is about, is that borders should be abolished. I take an example, the textile industry. Uh, during decades when uh, we didn't just allow any market in the textile industry because we feared the competition of weaker countries. And uh, when we began to open the border for textile imports, uh, our textile industry disappeared, more or less. This was exactly the mechanism you mentioned. But we have in many other dimensions such uh, excluding mechanism in our conception of the market. We accept market there where we like to have market. And we have, for example, in the agriculture, a uh, huge subvention economy because we don't accept the market there. So we accept the market rules there where we have uh, as... Uh, the political dominant part of the word advantages, and uh, we marginalize the market there where we could become, um, with the time, um, the loser. I think here is a political problem and not a market problem. Well, I agree. 
Mr. Villager. Yeah, I have, here I have a clear opinion. I think the only mechanism that can solve this problem is the market. And if you look at the last 60 years, I think never on this planet since millions of years, wealth had such a growth as during the last 60 years because of more free market, because of liberalization, because of globalization. We have less poor people f definition from the United Nations than 60 years ago by, in spite of the explosion of it. We have less differences between the countries and the ones who are not successful have two problems. They are blocked, uh, they do themselves kick out of the markets of the like uh, like Cuba or like uh, North Korea, or they are fail, failed states with uh, weak uh, with weak institutions, and that's the reason why the only way to make progress also for the poorest of this world <coughs> is more market and not uh, no borders. Because I am a great believer that we need a competition between countries because regul the only test really what regulation is good or not is if a country tries it. And I think if we have also a certain competition and uh, like the Chinese do it with the Sonderwirtschaftszone to test something and then they, they make it if it's good, I think that happens between countries. The national state will not disappear. But I think we should have more open borders, we should have more WTO and less bilateral agreement, things like that. And that would be for the benefit for everybody. And I very big doubts whether regulation will help because the more regulation for every problem you have, the more... The, the, the companies begin only to, to work for regulation. If you look at the bank, what they are doing today, that, that creates an over-regulation, creates new risks, and has also, as a consequence, a kind of crowding out of moral. I'm convinced the more rules you have, the more you are satisfied when you have checked in the checklist all the rules and you have done it. And then you have hundreds of lawyers who look at the loopholes and you use these loopholes uh, which are what is not yet forbidden with a good conscience because you think everything is regulated. If it's not regulated, I can do it. And with that, I'm convinced you are destroying the single responsibility of companies, of people. And that's the reason why I'm very skeptical. We need regulation, but we have really to look whether they have the, the good incentives or not. And we can build, as you said, with Switzerland in a free democracy, we can build on the risk the capacity of people to be responsible and with certain, to give them responsibility in a free, in a direct democracy or so, that shows that that can work. And I see much more good results in that direction, but in more regulation and more government and more this and more that. Professor Falk, you had three quite interesting questions from Martin Helvig on um, uh, power versus markets. Mm -hmm. The question about exchange of moral values. Um, and finally, uh, the abolition of advertising. Yeah, maybe I could just kind of answer that in one. It was a very clever question to combine the Milgram experiment with your example about authority and markets. Um, but it's slightly misguided anyways. Uh, and then let, me, let me tell you why. The, the exper experiments that we did have nothing to do with authority. Even if you would attribute the experiment to some authority, Remember that this is kept constant between conditions. So it cannot explain any treatment effect here. Um, would markets help to reduce the uh, misuse of authority and power? Yes. I'm, I'm very happy to agree totally and wholeheartedly on this point. And I think it's one of the great uh, virtues of markets, as there are many others. Remember, though, that the point that I was interested in is not on those who are actually taking part in these markets, but on third parties that are not actually involved. And that is something we sometimes overlook when we talk about efficiency or welfare. We always you know, include ourselves, but forget some people who are not sitting on a table. And of course, the more narrow I define efficiency for a particular group, it, it is more easy to come up with you know, why markets are good. But if I extend the set of people into my welfare um, considerations, then things become a little bit more difficult. So authority is not the channel. What is the channel? This is uh, maybe relating also to the two other questions, and I, I want to be brief here. Replacement is something I mentioned. Um, if I don't do it, someone else may. Social information is another one. Social norms are constructed in observing what other people are doing. We know that from previous research. And markets favor a particular type of social learning. And I don't want to give a formal argument, but I could, promise me. Because if you, if you are somewhat focusing from, from 
if you observe prices then you, and offers in markets, then you have a tendency to observe prices from the lower moral value distribution. Let me just leave it like that. And if social learning is important, then markets tend to favor learning from the lower part of the moral value distribution. So there's an inherent tendency to actually promote learning in the direction of moral decay. The third argument I think that is important is sharing guilt. In markets, like in many other situations, you always have a, um, um, a second person, at least a second person, who has some agreement in the issue, right? Like that's the same in division of labor or delegation, right? There's always some notion of sharing guilt or sharing responsibility that facilitates a moral transgression. But it's important to notice that these arguments or these channels are not necessarily and only relevant for markets. So I'm saying this happens in markets as well, but it's not you know, the only place where these things happen. And this is what I meant with distinction institutions and markets. Maybe this is a misleading uh, uh, terminology. What I meant to say is markets and non-market organizations, like firms, uh, political organizations, whatnot. And here, very similar mechanisms can be in place that are also at place in markets. So it's not saying that if we, even if we would get rid of markets altogether, all these mechanisms would disappear. The opposite is true. Replacement arguments, group organization, division of labor authority is an important mechanism to uh, in, uh, promote moral transgression. Is of course uh, um, happening in organizations and less so probably in markets. Right? So it's not markets yes, no, moral yes, no. It's, it's what are the mechanisms and some of these mechanisms are just very important in markets. Maybe, if I may, one final statement. I looked at the technology of killing recently. There's a very nice book. I forgot the author. I'm sorry about that. It is very difficult to kill you right now and here because, you know, I see you crying. I see your tears, you know. I don't know. I mean, I could probably do it like if I... Did you see Django Unchained? I mean, this, this is, it is awful, right? It's easier if I can take a gun and, you know, take a shot from 20 meters away or something. It's, much easier if I can push a button and send a drone. Yeah, or, yeah. And something very similar is happening. Uh, I'm mentioning this because you were talking about the good old days where, you know, transaction, the Erbacher Kaufmann, and, and you know, where, where relationships were quite close. It is much easier to enforce social norms if you know people, if, if uh, reputation is gone, on, if, if you have built a sense of human, uh, of social capital, of trust and, and reputation and repeated game incentives, etc. Um, it's much easier to sustain moral values in a globalized world where you deal with people that you never see, where you have victims that you never realize, whose tears you don't see, if you like. Right? Uh, just as an analogy to the te technology of killing facilitates moral wrongdoing because you just don't see it. You know, if someone falls down here and is crying, there's a total outcry and everybody's shocked, right? And it's the most important thing that has happened during the week, right? Um, if that happens in another city, 10 kilometers from here, no one even cares, right? If you, and the, from the information corner, it's exactly the same. So proximity, uh, remoteness of things, and, and it is, is something that is important. And I think in a, in a very developed economy that, that we have, that also contributes to, you know, this distance contributes to moral transgression. But that's presumably, I mean, again, we have exactly the same response to a local disaster of a natural kind and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, di distancing is part of who we are. You'd wear, I mean, there were a couple of other questions, but I am interested actually in your view on advertising. My view? That was the question that was oh, asked, whether, whether we should suppress advertising because it... In sorry? Just regulate. Nothing. Regulate. Well, well, I'm, I mean, I'm it is actually regulated, regulated. to some extent. Um, there are limits on what you can advertise to children? No, absolutely. To yeah, yeah, no, it, there are limits. Of course there are limits. You can do everything. Um, Any um, other questions? Ah, somebody there. Please stand up. If you want to ask a question towards the back, the best thing is to stand up because I can't see so clearly. Please. I just wanted to say that, I mean, I, I agree with what you said, but Rwanda, what happened in Rwanda and Bosnia, or more generally Yugoslavia, would be a counterexample to what you said. Speak right, I mean, a bit louder in the, in the micro. Yeah. Oh, don't sorry. You well, yeah? What happened in Rwanda and uh, Yugoslavia were counterexamples to what you said because people were killed by their, by their neighbors. So. Okay. Well, any other questions back there? Somebody, the gentleman behind there. We didn't really discuss whether there isn't also a market for moral behavior. People buy fair trade t shirts mm -hmm. because they feel better. Nestle reduces the fat contents in its breakfast cereals because it thinks people live a healthier life afterwards, whereas Mr. Bloomberg failed abysmally 
in doing the same with large soft drinks. Holcim, one of the world's largest cement manufacturers, imposes the same CO2 emissions targets throughout the world, even though they're only forced to do so in Western Europe. Why would they do that? Maybe there's a market for moral behavior after all. Maybe there are investment funds who say, this is a better company than others, so we invest in them. And in the end, all of a sudden, the market produces morality rather than being amoral, as, as two of the three panelists have said. OK, one more question here. Please stand up. Thank you. Um, I'm just following up to what's been said before. Um, because during the discussion, I just uh, tax crossed my mind. Because me, as a resident of this country, I pay my tax. This is my contribution, my social contribution as well, which is regulated by a law, which I agree with, because this is my moral contribution to get my mind clear about what I contribute to the society. So nowadays, corporations, in the past, they used to pay their tax in the countries where they were. Though nowadays, obviously, we have these tax loopholes, which have been mentioned before. <clears throat> and there's companies which actually seem not to have moral qualms, not to bring back their profits to be taxed at their country of origin. So I'm just wondering what that development will look like in the future, because to me it has taken a sort of a dramatic development lately. OK, I think I get that. Um, that's giving me an opening which you probably will regret. Um, <laughs> um, let's start with Rwanda. I mean, I presume the implication of what you said was not that people aren't quite good at killing their neighbours because obviously they have had, we have plenty of experience of people being quite happy to kill their neighbours. Oh, what's the question? I think that's addressed to you. Um, remoteness facilitates killing, that was the argument, and I think that is, um, that is pretty universal, and this is established in this research on it, and it's psychologically just easier. That, that's all I wanted to say. It doesn't mean that people don't kill each other. What I wonder... Sad, sadly enough, I mean, I don't want to be a cynic or something. Do you, what do you think of this idea, which is the second part of that question, which does seem to me an interesting one we haven't discussed, which is market mechanisms, essentially reputational and other such mechanisms, that encourage market behaviour or appear to encourage market behaviour. Um, let's start with you, Professor Falk, and then we'll ask the other two. You mean moral behaviour? Didn't I say that? Model, moral behaviour. If I didn't, I'm sorry. No, I could see that. And, and um, you could have mentioned ethic investments, for example, and as you, know, you mentioned before, uh, interest groups that are promoting um, you know, critical consumption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I don't have any problem with saying that markets can be very helpful in, in, um, in uh, finding better solutions, in organizing people to contribute to good causes, etc., etc. I don't have any problem with that. But if I look around, that's not the whole story. Right? So again, I mean, almost again and again, I could add 10 good reasons for why we shouldn't abolish markets and why there are circumstances that there are promoting good outcomes, limiting authority, for example, and, and you know, giving people freedom to move out, if they, et cetera, limiting suppression and these things. There are many good examples. But there are also side effects. And, and uh, by pointing out good aspects of it, uh, you're not at the same time saying that the bad aspects don't exist. And all I wanted to focus on in my presentation here or by my presence here is, yes, there are some of these negative effects. And it's worthwhile to think about them and to improve markets to make them even better. So I'm not, I don't need to be convinced that we need markets or that, markets can, that there are many circumstances where markets are just doing great. That's not the point. The point is, can we improve them even better? And I think it's in some circumstances, and I think, look around, open your eyes, it's very transparent. Markets do actually cause a lot of harm. And we could do something about it. We have not talked about commercialization effects, the use of money, the use of price tags, how relationships are sometimes transformed 
for example, from social relationships that are built on trust, reciprocity, or reputation. And if you introduce incentives, price mechanisms, it sometimes commercializes a, a previously socially defined relationship into something that is now viewed as a market transaction. That can have detrimental effects in its own. Uh, there's tons of studies that show that, that you can actually crowd out uh, pro-social values or uh, mutual trust expectations, et cetera, by using price mechanisms, price tags. There's a whole issue that we haven't talked about. It has nothing to do with markets in a, in a broader sense, but with how market economies function as we talk about firms and, and using incentive mechanisms. So the overly use of, you mentioned this at the very beginning, the, the possibility of crowding out civic virtues or you know, social relations and the transformation of social relationships into transactions, economic transactions, commercial uh, relationships is also an aspect that, that, that uh, should be mentioned here. Mr. Villiger, I'm particularly interested in your view on tax. Uh -huh. uh, the, the competition <laughs> among yeah. uh, companies. Some would say that it's competition among countries to attract companies. Yeah. I'm personally convinced that the only way that the citizen is protected by being exploited by the fisc fiscal centre, the, the state, is tax competition. And I'm a believer of that. And if, the, if Switzerland is successful, uh, a main part of this success is due to the tax competition between the cantons. And it was not true that one canton went bankrupt. The canton must, of course, know that nobody helps. I think this is also important to not create a moral hazard problem. And I think that a tax competition forces the canton or the, or the state or, 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 or whatever uh, to, to, to deliver a price performance relation which is good for the citizen. And, and, and that's the only mean, and, and it works. And you see in Switzerland that our, uh, to, together with the federalism in the Swiss view of it, you know, with cantons which have a lot of autonomy and also fiscal autonomy, the the, 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 what the state is doing for the citizen is more focused than in other countries and is also uh, done with, uh, in spite of the very complicated federal system, uh, done with less, uh, with less uh, People, less employee, employed people by the state. Now, of course, there is a race. I didn't see the race to the bottom until now, but there is, a, there is of course, a tax arbitration worldwide, which is uh, under the pressure uh, of the competition between the companies that they have a lot of specialists which look the best way to close loopholes. And they have a, a certain understanding for the G20 that they want to tackle that problem. My fear is that that goes back to a cartel and that would be the worst also for the develop, development of people. But in a way, in a way, uh, as a normal taxpayer, uh, also a company, of course, uses services of the state and should pay something. And interestingly, uh, I think the average tax amount paid by European companies is higher than the American country, uh, companies in spite of the fact that there the taxes are higher. I think there's so much regulation there that the moral uh, crowding out uh, happens a bit in this part of the world more than in Europe, what I said before. If everything is, is really is really uh, regulated, you, you, use, you use the loopholes better. That's why I have a certain understanding, but I think a certain tax competition is healthy, because otherwise the, 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 the politicians have the tendency to solve the problems with more taxes and not with, uh, not with, uh, with, uh, with less, uh, I don't know, less spending. And that's the reason why we in Switzerland introduced the debt break, which seems to be quite uh, successful to, to give an incentive to the politicians to spend a little bit, a little bit less. Another thing, I think, what, I think it was Ernst telling it that trust. I think in Switzerland we have the system that uh, you declare your taxes yourself and you give it and the state believes it and it's not criminalized if you make a little mistake. I know you can, you can uh, discuss, is, is that always just and what is crime and what is, what is only, uh, what, is I, I, what is a vergehen or a fraud or what is a fraud or only evas evasion or all of that. But I, th I am convinced that the tax fraud in Switzerland is a little bit lower than in other countries because because the, the, the government gives them a certain trust, confidence. 
And I'm convinced if we now as a lot wants to make that stronger and more punishment and so on, if the citizens feel, of course there is also tax evasion in Switzerland, no doubt, and the Verrechnungssteuer is a little mean, winked with them Zaunfall to help a little bit to this honesty. But I'm convinced if the state comes with more policemen and so on, we have more fraud afterwards. Because you lose then, if, if your partner doesn't trust you anymore, you don't trust anymore to your partner. And I think also in these issues that there is a kind, there are a kind of moral values that we should, that we should uh, plague and that we should uh, maintain and, and, and not lose with all this more regulation. And I come back to the regulation again. Uh, if you make regulation for advertisement, I, I think our people are mature enough to see what is silly and what not if they look at the television. Uh, and there are also uh, NGOs who criticize uh, advertisement and so on. And without advertisement, if you ban advertisement, you have no progress anymore. You have much progress if you can advertise the cheaper motor car, the motor car with less gasoline, the motor car, it isn't that. And that they pack that in a little bit more nice picture than only a, a list with, with values and, and so on. That's clear to, to give a little bit, you must smell the good restaurant, not only know what the price is. I think this you can, you cannot ban. I would be totally against that. And if you have too, too much regulation, again, they will find ways, uh, you know, like uh, when you banned tobacco advertisements and began to sponsor football teams and so on, they find other ways to go around. I prefer the open legal way and then you can uh, criticize it also. What do you think about tax secrecy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, years ago. That existed yes. still. And uh, yeah, La I was. Last year, I think. Yeah. I do not <coughs> want to have another, another speech. No, no. That, that was weakened since a lot, since a lot of time. Uh, when I took over the helm, uh, as a, the helmet as Minister of Finance, already first steps to, to open the bank secrecy has been taken. And during my time, we did a lot. We introduced uh, anti money laundering, we introduced new insider rules, we introduced a lot of. And I negotiated with the European Union the, the Zinsbesteuerungs, the, the savings uh, directive, the savings agreement, which was a first step to open and to tell if there is money here, at least that money should go back to the, uh, to, to the Union, to the country where it comes from. And when the system has loopholes, they are due to the definitions of the European Union and not of Switzerland. I very often said to Hans Eichel, who was one of my, from Germany, uh, you make a mistake, you should include these and these and these. We cannot do everything at once. That's why I do not like these critics. But the first step we did was uh, when we realized that uh, the bank secrecy is abused, for, for, especially for international crime, for drug traffic, things like that. Uh, we, I think we are the most advanced country worldwide uh, in fighting things like that. And when the Abacha, you, you remember the Abacha case, when billions mm. came out, I think we found them in Switzerland. And because of Switzerland, we found them and opened it. It was a, a lot of case, this, this minister of Nigeria. And then afterwards, they found two or three billion in London and maybe four in New York. In all the countries who say we are cleaner than Switzerland, they found more, but we discovered it in Switzerland. And that shows it works. But then at that time, I think tax evasion was a little bit the gentleman's uh, thing, was not yet so. So, uh, and I must personally say I underestimated the amount of money that was not taxed. I thought there are uh, more clean monies also in our country. And, but the first step was that uh, was this agreement, and I think now the the Abgeltungssteuer, this uh, abolition, uh, abolition tax would have been a better solution, also bringing more money to this country. But this is over because during the crisis, of a certain understanding, all the finance ministers worldwide came together and said, now we have to to dry out this this uh, this. Uh, these places, uh, and I think already today the bank secrecy doesn't exist anymore in Switzerland. It's only the, the question is how do you find the people who, uh, what's the most efficient way, if there are suspicions, if there is material that there could be a fraud, uh, Switzerland gives information every, every month a little bit more. And uh, I think the only problem we have to solve is uh, the, the legacy problem. What to, how 
to treat honestly the ones who have believed that they are safe in Switzerland and uh, now they are not. I think there we have a, a kind of responsibility. They came here because they got some promises and now to help them to, to come in a clean situation. I think this is also a moral question, but we should help them. And uh, as far as I know, my, the bank where I worked for, they do a lot of work to convince the people to make it clean and to open, uh, open the things. I think it was not a sustainable model anymore. Some little things are disturbing. Uh, it's the easiest uh, way to, uh, to open an account uh, without uh, telling your name is Delaware uh, and with, uh, where you are specialist in Great Britain with the tr trust, you have to declare but you can hide the beneficial owner, owner behind the trusts. I think there is a lot of hypocrisy uh, in this field. Also, if you are a manager of a big company, you get the best offers from London, not from Switzerland. Uh, I think here, uh, doing and telling, uh, and I fight a little bit against the impression that the only bad, bad guy in this, on this planet is Switzerland. I think uh, more and more the contrary is true. I think... Sorry. Sorry. No. <laughs> I thought I had to give you the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to, um, to take more questions. I think what I'll do now is just ask if, if any one of you has a, uh, something they particularly want to say, which is particularly burning, uh, that you want the people here to take away on this subject. Is, uh, or do you feel that you have been able to say everything that you need to say? Mr. Deve. <laughs> Just uh, a few words. I think uh, Switzerland is one of the most complicated political systems in the world and one of the most efficient. And uh, I think we are able to combine high performance with stability because the checks and balances of the system just uh, ensure <laughs> that was enlightenment. <laughs> this is obviously one of the checks. <laughs> they just Be closed us because down. Because those uh, checks and balances yeah. ensure an equilibrium of economic values and non-economic values. And uh, this type of system was seen the last three decades as anachronistic. I think it is very, very modern. We need more and more of this type of checks and balances, not only on the national level, but also on the international level. During an area of three or four decades of the capitalism, it was called soziale Marktwirtschaft. What it will be in the next decades, I don't know. But uh, this uh, thinking, not just in economic term, not in economism, but uh, seeking the equilibrium between non-economic non values and economic values, I think this is the most modern climate and the most modern system we could imagine. Professor Falk. Uh, very briefly, um, economics should better understand moral behavior and why ordinary people behave in a morally obscure way, which is a pervasive phenomenon. And I think uh, we are equipped with very good techniques to do that. So I'm kind of optimistic that we will shed light on these issues over the next years. And one thing that is probably most important is uh, restore individual responsibility, connect action and outcome. I think to create enough wealth for everybody, and to fight against poverty, we need as much market as possible. Market works only if we have a strong state who defines a regulatory framework and guidelines and a sustainable framework. Uh, I think we can discuss the limits. Uh, we need some rules. But the overlay, over regulated market economy cannot perform enough. And we need free space for moral behavior. And we have also in economy and in politics to work on that. I'm not going to summarise, because actually I think it's impossible. Um, <laughs> it confirms to me the most important point, which I, I learnt in the, the years I studied philosophy at Oxford, probably shown 
with very little benefit, which is that ethical discussion is hopelessly confused and confusing. Uh, and we have made remarkably little progress in the last two and a half thousand years in our discussion of it, though I think actually ethical standards have rather improved, which is perhaps a miracle. Perhaps it shows philosophers don't contribute much. But the, what comes out of this discussion to me, is a very interesting way of thinking about this, is that um, certainly two of the speakers, Mr. Devec and Mr. Villiger, had very clearly, sort of at the back of their minds, a consequentialist view of morality. Namely, they, what they were interested in, in fact, um, Mr. Villiger talked about it, in processes that lead to prosperity, that allow people to participate in markets, um, a lot of the list of harms that you alluded to are all of the bad things happen as a result of market processes. So this is a consequentialist view, and if you're not a consequentialist, then none of these turn out to be moral issues at all. Then we, we did clearly talk about processes and um, freedom, freedom of choice. So Martin Helvig's question particularly related to that and the, the sort of voice exit type issues uh, become central in when we're discussing this aspect of, uh, of quote-unquote moral behaviour uh, or, or institutions or processes that lead to moral behaviour. And then, then, of course, we also had a very strong concentration on how particular institutional frameworks um, influence the behaviour of individuals, which one would see as inherently moral or immoral. Um, it seems to me part of the difficulty in having a really good discussion of this sort of topic is that people have fundamentally different institutions of what is morally important. I mean, it's just sort of fundamentally true. That's, they do actually disagree. I also happen to think that not only that, is that they hold quite strongly moral perceptions which are actually in conflict. Um, and that we don't have clear, coherent, most of us at least, completely clear, co uh, coherent views of morality. I don't know how the, the market economy has, has come out of this discussion, except the conclusion is it's inevitable. It has some very, very desirable attributes in all these three dimensions, but we wish it were in some important respects better. Uh, uh, we differ to some degree on what respects precisely. So there is plenty of agenda for action and plenty of reasons for you to hold another seminar now on how to make markets even morally better. So thanks to the panelists, where I found it a very intriguing discussion, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you very much.